Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our second uh, webinar in our new webinar series that will hopefully be occurring on a monthly basis. Thank you for taking your time out of the day to join us to discuss this very important topic around how we as a healthcare culture can help make healthcare more affordable by implementing true continuous costing strategies. Um, we have Rob Fallmeyer, our lead analyst, kind of covering this side of analytics and revenue for the organization, taking lead on this webinar. Um, and yeah, so first off, I'd like to introduce you to Chillmark Research and share a little bit about our um, our aspirations and our philosophy around how we approach healthcare IT. We are an analyst firm that focuses exclusively on the market for healthcare IT solutions. And our core beliefs here that help us frame our research and what topics we'll be focusing on are that effective deployment and use of IT will contribute to improving the delivery of care and ultimately the patient experience. It is our goal to help make sure that both the patient and the healthcare provider experience is improved as we try to fix the healthcare system. We focus on those technologies that will be transformational to healthcare delivery, and you can see that by the choices of topics um, that we choose to cover as our domain. And we tr provide comprehensive, objective, high-quality research to create a more informed market on the effective adoption and use of IT. So a little bit about Rob. Rob came to us a few years ago. He has a good deal of experience on the analyst side, having spent many years over on Wall Street. Um, he is the only person in his family not in medical practice, so he has a lot of personal experience discussing all of these matters with his friends and family. Um, he comes to us having worked at quite a few diverse technology organizations, as you can see in this brief bio. But most importantly, he was a research analyst with the Meta Group for many years, where he got trained to really become a very strong analyst, as well as spending a dozen years on Wall Street um, and being involved in over two dozen public company transactions, primarily around business intelligence, database, and data integration software sectors. So he comes with a good deal of experience that is particularly relevant to this subject that we will be discussing today. I will let Rob take over now and dig right in. And if you have any questions that come up during the during the webinar, please feel free to just enter them in your GoToWebinar uh, panel. I look forward to hearing what you have to ask. All yours, Rob. Okay, thanks, John. So, um, what, what we want to talk about today is uh, is the idea uh, that managing cost is a really important part of healthcare. I'm going to go into uh, how the money flows into healthcare, where it comes from, and where it goes. We're going to in introduce the concept of true continuous costing. Uh, I'll compare that to other ways that people think about managing costs within healthcare. There are objections because it is a change in culture and a change in how people do things uh, financially and managerially within healthcare. And uh, a lot of this stuff is covered in the report. Uh, especially the details on true continuous costing. One thing that's not in the report that I've added to this webinar are some case studies where we can see uh, where uh, true continuous costing has been implemented in the United States and abroad. <clears throat> and then finally, I'll uh, have some recommendations how you can get started to improve the overall situation that you're that you're in. So why are we paying attention to this? Well. Providers are in a pretty tough spot. Revenue is coming down. The reimbursement uh, landscape is changing dramatically. It all leads to less money, less top line. Meanwhile, your costs are going up organically. The amount of money that you pay for things, uh, your labor costs are going up, your material costs are going up. Every aspect of what you do is going up from a cost basis. And a lot of these costs are obviously administrative driven uh, administrative driven costs. The, the other issue that's facing healthcare today is an increase in demand. So you have, we have more and more people coming to you for healthcare services and more complex services. Meanwhile, the consumers, nobody is surprised that reads the news, the consumers, the patients are really freaking out over how much it costs to get healthcare. 
Their premiums are going up, their out-of-pockets going up in the terms of co-pays and deductibles. And even though they're paying more, they're finding it uh, difficult to get, to get the care they need to see doctors. Most people that go into healthcare <clears throat> are really focused on, on the patient. That's what they care about. Very few people go into healthcare, want to know about the financial aspects. So most of your patients ask you questions about if they get a new diagnosis, are they going to survive? If they're getting treatment, they want to make sure they're going to get better. And everybody wants to know about, about pain. Is what you're going to do for me, this procedure or this, this uh, stay in the hospital, how badly is it going to hurt? But more and more, what people are asking about healthcare is can they afford it? So when a loved one or a family member or they themselves receive a new diagnosis or are being told they need to see the doctor or go to the hospital, the thing that really pops into their mind is how am I going to pay for this? How can I cover it? Do I have enough money in the bank to cover my deductible? My premiums are going up. How am I going to pay for health care? So the big concern for all everybody, all stakeholders in, in healthcare today, has to be around the affordability or the pricing of of, uh, of healthcare. And there's really no surprise if you look at the numbers. We spend about three trillion. These are the 2014 CMS verified numbers. We spend about three trillion dollars for on healthcare, and that's for a population of about 313 million people. That's about uh, eight nine thousand dollars per person. If you look at the the slide deck, the slide here, the chart, you can see that almost all of the money, all of the spending, goes to spending on things. Very little in the way of profits for the insurance company, the drug companies, and even the total cost of insurance is only about six <clears> percent. <throat> One number I like you to to retain is because we're going to need it for the next slide, is the provider profits are only about 2% of the total spending. That's about all there, there are. CMS recently came out with the new estimates, and now in 2016, we're crossing through the $10,000 per person barrier, and they're expecting growth for their 10-year projection will be 6% per year over the next 10 years. So where does the money come from to pay for health care? The big payer, of course, is the government. Most people don't realize this. I think when I tell people uh, how much the government pays already for health care, it's uh, well over half. Private insurance is about a third, and out-of-pocket range is somewhere between 10 or 12 percent, depending on exactly how you calculate it. On the right, you can see where the money goes. The, the 2016 number works out to about 3.3 trillion. Uh, over two thirds of that three point three point three trillion uh, dollars goes to providers because the profits are very slim in the provider world, as all you providers know. Uh, on average, it's about again two percent. So over two thirds of all the money coming into healthcare goes to the providers, and they turn around and spend it on uh, on people that they hire to provide the services and stuff that they need to run. The hospitals and the private and the primary care services, other ambulatory uh, facilities, uh, skilled nursing facilities, etc. So the money coming into healthcare, about two trillion dollars worth, is spent by providers. So if we're going to save money on healthcare, reduce the cost of healthcare, what we have to figure out and not lose quality or deny more access. We have to figure out how to deliver the health care much, much more cheaply. So that's kind of the big picture, the high-level view. I, I then, not too hard, I looked at this many years ago when Obamacare was being announced just to try to get a handle, and I've been tracking it for the years, the kind of growth, realizing that how we pay for health care is not going to really do much to reduce how much we pay for health care. Another big catalyst for me to get into this research was the Time Magazine article that came out a couple of years ago. The gist of the article was that a patient A goes into a hospital and has a procedure or some uh, service provided and the charge, the, what they paid, not the charge, but what they paid would be $400. Meanwhile, a different patient goes to the same hospital and what they end up paying is $400. The, the gist of the article was that 
this was some big ripoff that if you could do it for $400, you could do it and you did it for 4,000, everything else was that the excess, the $3,600 was a ripoff. But was not in the article and not discussed was how much did it actually cost to provide those services? Did the $400 service really cost the same as the $4,000 service? How do we know that that $400 service did not cost $1,000 for the hospital to provide? Or how did we know that it then cost $3,800 gross? So after overhead, no, the hospital actually didn't make money on this service, no matter how much it was charging. The interesting thing I saw was that there was really no pushback or very little pushback from the industry to come back and explain kind of the marginal cost, the real profitability, and how much it really costs to run a hospital or any kind of medical practice and where the money went. So I decided to dive in, and that's the result of this research, is me diving in to try to figure out how providers think about cost. The first answer was most providers really don't think about cost. They don't know their cost on a patient-by-patient -patient basis. There are some providers that actually look at it from a budgeting and planning viewpoint, and they're quite happy if the quarterly or monthly revenue and expenses meet the targets. That's about the visibility that they look at in the granularity. There are some providers that dig a little deeper, looking at RVU or RC, RCCs to uh, kind of proxy costs or maybe use charges to get an average cost per type. But there are a few providers, and we're going to talk about them in the, in the uh, case studies, and we'll talk about how they do go about it and, the, and when I reveal the true continuous costing methodology that actually get the actual cost patient by patients on a gross and contribution margin basis. Okay, so our solution is true continuous costing. And, here, and here's how it works. What, 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 what I first wanted to investigate in, in doing this research is how much data do providers have that they could use to really learn all of the details of cost for everything they do on behalf of a patient while that patient is in their care. Because the idea that you could go around and spend money and time bringing in activity-based consulting uh, uh, consultants to go through your organization with clipboards and stopwatches and record all the costs and calculate all the costs would never work in healthcare. It's too expensive, the data is very perishable, and you really, you really, unless you're there all the time capturing this, you really don't see the changes or really understand what's going on. So the question is, are you already generating all the data that you need as a provider to really understand how much it costs to take care of patients? And the answer was, of course, it's there. Now, it's not obvious where it is in all cases. You have to look a little bit, you have to hunt around, but between your EHR systems, the log files they generate, all the maintenance ports, all the data that's being captured in your imaging uh, devices, the x-ray machines, the uh, MRI machines, the barcodes, if you have them, is great because you get the usage plus you get timestamps. Your supply chain management systems, your ERP, your intake systems, your HR systems, all of this data is in the organization right now. A couple of places where you might need to add a little bit or tweak a little bit, but the data is basically there. So you take the data in true continuous costing, you take that data, you pull it out, you load it into a, a small data warehouse, you're basically building a record of the patient that's the inverse of the bill. So you, and again, you can use billing data to find out the things that you do for the patient. So we're collecting this laundry list of things we do, we're then finding the costs, we're putting that in a database, and it looks kind of similar to the bill. It's the inverse of the bill. That's what's in the database. We can present this data using advanced and modern uh, 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 data visualization technology, data exploration technology, dashboard technology, technology like Tableau, ClickView, Spotfire, a lot of, there's maybe a half a dozen, a dozen vendors right now that make it very easy for end users to access data and explore it visually and present it visually. 
once we have this data collected, we've got it visually, we can start looking at variances and changes in the cost of delivering care, compare that against outcome data, and we can start to define cost-effective care plans so that we, we have cost as a factor of the type of care that we deliver and how we design how we're going to take care of patients. So the keys are really pretty simple to, to adopting true continuous costing. You gather data, and, and we're gonna give one example where they started big and then had a very large project, but you can start really small. And most of the successes that we've seen in, in, in adopting uh, true continuous costing is to start small with a particular department, a DRG set, so you can start with your imaging department, you can do it uh, with total joints, it's a great one because of the bundle payment situation we have right now coming out of CMS. You can do it with the imaging department because your reimbursements for imaging are coming down. Uh, they're trying to cut the number of x-rays that you deliver, so your revenue is gonna come down uh, uh, in terms of volume. So, and there's tons of data over in the imaging department, so you can really start to look at productivity and understand how to start to make that department more efficient and more productive. You have to use the real cost. You have them, you have to be a bit of a data detective to figure out where they are, but they're there. It's not really that difficult to figure out where it is, but you have to hunt around to find the data. Once you start becoming a data detective, it's kind of amazing how much data you'll find you have to generate uh, costs for patients. The information, again, has to be prevented, presented using the modern data visualization tools so that you can discover the variances in the, uh, in the cost. They're graphically depicted so you don't have to see walls of numbers. And the variance will show you where your hotspots are in cost. You can compare similar procedures you can compare uh, different, different procedures just to see if the variances look same and make sense to you. But the Rosetta Stone, the real map that gives you the idea of where you've got hotspots and costs are, are uh, reflected in, in the variances that can be graphically depicted using the modern tools. Because we're using electronics, this data is updated in real time. You don't have to look at it second by second, but you can look at it daily, weekly, monthly, and it gives you tremendous visibility, as we'll see in the case studies, of, of any pending problem that you may have with revenue or uh, shortfalls or out of control costs. The important part about this is we're trying to deliver value, not just quality. And again, it's not activity-based costing. There are definitely barriers to uh, adoption. Uh, the biggest and hardest part of this is that you have to learn and understand how to integrate data. That can be difficult for some people, for some organizations, but I have found that really anybody who is uh, experienced uh, in, in uh, informatics or uh, any of your IT people can gather, can figure out how to do this pretty quickly. There's a lot of technology. Some systems are easier to get to than others. Epic is a little more difficult, but there are technologies available today that allow you to pull any data you want out of Epic. Uh, your ERP systems like Lawson are relatively easily. They're designed to be able to pull data out of. Uh, most purchasing systems can do it. Most surgical systems allow you to pull data out reasonably easy. So it's not really rocket science to do this in a week or two of training to learn how to use the tools uh, really get you uh, get you over the hurdle again it's bottoms up not tops down is really what the data integration challenge is all about and because it's software it's all reusable and lever leverageable the cultural changes are a little more difficult uh, utilization reduction is a big problem right now everybody's trying to meet macro objectives ACOs so there's a lot of focus on that. Then we've got all the issues with clinical outcomes, um, medical error problems. So there's a lot of, a lot of things to, to focus on. And the RCM, of course, uh, I'm a member of the HFMA. I go to the conferences. It's 99.9% uh, talk of how to get more revenue. There's diminishing returns there. Uh, not that many people are focused on reducing costs, but we'll show you in the, uh, 
in the case studies that the people that do a focus on cost uh, reach, have fantastic results. One of the other things I hear culturally is that doctors won't change. That has not been true based upon our research. If you show doctors the facts that their real costs are much higher than another doctor or other doctors, that they're outliers, and you can show them why their costs are higher, they'll change overwhelmingly. Now, there are exceptions, and we'll show you how to deal with the exceptions when we get into the case studies, but they will change. You can't show them RVUs or estimates or guessworks or charges. You have to show them the real data, and they will respond is what we have found uh, in almost every case. There's economic challenges. We know everybody's tight on budget. It's hard to bring in new people or start new projects, but the payback when it's done is always there. The idea that all budgetary problems are solved by more revenue has to be broken, and you have to look at your cost, because that's really where your low-hanging fruit is right now. It's in reducing costs. So the case studies. First case study is kind of our exception to the rule in terms of how to go about implementing. Uh, the new CFO, a new CFO uh, came in, very strong, powerful uh, CFO. She asked the, the people that ran the uh, hospital how much does a minute of OR time cost? The obvious answer is it depends. It depends on what the OR is doing at the time. Uh, complicated procedures require more staff, more equipment usage, more supplies, more everything. But nobody knew, no matter what the OR was doing, how much it cost. She decided to embark on a, on a, a system-wide project throughout the entire uh, system at the university hospital at Utah. Uh, it was a very large uh, project, a lot of time and labor. They're still working on it, but the early results are that they're already saving money. The interesting thing about these projects is operational visibility. That hospital does not have to wait until the next budget cycle to see where there's a potential shortfall because they're gathering in real time any potential train wreck they can see coming way down the tracks because they're looking at the data that's coming. The next is kind of the contrast to that. Uh, the project at New Haven Hospital was started as what came, came as part of a quality program. The, the program was really, let's improve quality. And somebody said, well, you know, we can do infinite quality with infinite dollars, but we don't have infinite dollars. We're gonna get paid less. That's just a fact. And we gotta improve quality. They brought in a vendor at the University of Utah, it was mostly an internal project. At, at, uh, at, at Yale New Haven, a vendor was heavily involved from the very beginning. And because it was clinically driven, the, the, the clinical staff dove into the project right away and they got it. They locked in immediately on the idea that just doing better quality isn't good enough. We need better quality at a lower cost to us. It turned obviously a smaller scope, which is something we like as a starting point. You can leverage the small projects easily. Everything is transferable to a bigger project that you learn and that you, you develop. The savings had three points. First of all, better quality. Secondly, lower cost. And third, they had, um, they were able to, uh, have higher margins. They actually improved the, fit, the fiscal viability of the hospital at the same time they improved the, uh, the quality. The next, uh, the next example is HCA, which is a, a pioneer in, uh, in, in doing uh, true continuous costing. They've been at it for a long time. They build a detailed bill of materials and labor for uh, every patient encounter. This is a necessity. This is really what we're doing, is building this detailed bill of materials. We're keeping it so we can analyze it later. They then uh, check for a gross margin contribution, gross and contribution mar margin analysis, because if you, have, if you don't have gross margins, you don't have any margin. It all starts with calculating your gross margin, and they do for every patient encounter. 
because they're a publicly traded company, they really have to do this. Because we've seen here in Florida now where I live and where I'm a member of the HFMA, a number of hospitals, one of the latest is the excellent Baptist South Health System, great system, uh, unexpectedly a major potential revenue shortfall came up, they scrambled, they fixed it, but if they were a publicly company, they'd have to issue an earnings warning. The earnings warning would cause the stock to go down. This would cause potentially shareholder lawsuits and the SEC and they're all over them, uh, you know, checking it out, doing investigations. There could be a lot of big problems happen if you have to do an earnings warning. So at, at HCA, they really have turned this into a primary fundamental part of the operation of the hospital. I'm not really completely clear on exactly why they deploy the information the way they do. Um, it's not as modern as I'd like to see it. Uh, not sure, we think there's some changes going on over there, not completely sure, but we can talk about these guys a little more. One of the measurable benefits of this project, at, of this, of this uh, system at, at HCA is their labor costs, their labor cost as a percentage of revenue is 10 to 15% below the typical hospital. Cleveland Clinic, the state of Ohio, when uh, Kasich became governor, uh, basically went to all the providers in Ohio and said, for a lo long list of things that we, we, we get healthcare services from you providers, we're gonna get you, give you one check, that's it. There's no more kind of making it up in volume where you can you know, suddenly give somebody six aspirins where you got a big margin and make the number. We're gonna pay you one time for a whole bunch of things. And Cleveland being a very smart, well-run operation said, geez, we gotta get our costs under control. They dove into this, um, embraced it, jumped on it, uh, build the databases. They are the best use of variance analysis I've ever seen. It's a little hard to get them to show you what they're doing. There are a few vendors that can give you some clues, uh, and I've seen some of it. it the, the variance analysis is just awesome. They compare everything. They're always looking for deltas and changes of what's going on, historical, across similar procedures, even dissimilar procedures. They use this to dramatically uh, cut the cost of total joints, for example, the big problem they found was doctors ordering inappropriately inexpensive implants. Once they showed the doctors the impact of this on costs, nearly all the doctors got on board without very much trouble. There were a few outliers, but once you have the data, you see the outliers and you see that they're actually costing you massive amounts of money, it can really justify having the talk with them, and maybe even cutting some of them loose, which is what actually happened at Cleveland Clinic. The last, the last case study is, uh, is Northern Europe. Healthcare prices in Europe are much lower than they are in the United States. And it's not because everybody is on single payer or there's healthcare rationing in Europe. It's just not the case. Every country that we've looked at that uses true continuous costing in Europe has a different payment system. Some of them, like the UK, has a mostly uh, government-paid healthcare and government-run hospital system, although that is changing. There's more and more private pay, private care, private clinics in the UK. There's 60 hospitals in the UK that we know of that are doing true continuous costing. Their costs are way below uh, hospitals that we see in the US that do not do it. They're comparable with the internal cost of hospitals in the US that we do see doing it, doing true continuous costing. Uh, Holland uh, has a healthcare system very similar to the US where there's kind of a basic care that you get and then you buy private insurance with a robust private healthcare insurance market there. Their costs are much lower than our, our costs. Uh, so it's working uh, there. Uh, in Norway, the government's now saying that if you want a license to operate a healthcare uh, provider system, you have to use a true continuous costing. And what we've seen in Europe is this, what they, they call it 
patient level costing. It's a good term. I like true continuous costing better because we're capturing the idea that we're using the true cost and we're doing it continuously. It's not a one-shot deal. Uses our basic principles, and this is all in the report. Real cost data, not RVUs or charges or some other method. It's the real cost. It's bottoms up. There's a gross and net margin calculator for every patient encounter, so they do apply some overhead. You guys that are generating your 2552 reports know what I'm talking about, except you, you, you apply the overhead to a gross. You just don't take all the cost and apply it. There's variance analysis as pervasive. They, have, they use all of the modern tools. Uh, after all, ClickView is a Swedish company. Uh, they use a lot of Tableau. They use all of these data visualization tools. And the cultural difference is striking. Anybody that you talk to that's involved in, in that I've ever spoken to in, in healthcare, especially since I've done this research, they recognize the quality of care is, is a large part of care, but so is cost, that you can't just be blind to how much it's costing you to deliver care to the patient. So there's really no pushback or cultural or challenges to the notion of doing, of doing true continuous costing. They get it and understand it immediately. So the recommendations here are really simple. You can get started anywhere. This does not require the army of people that, that, that worked on it at Utah, uh, one or two people can do it. You can, we'll come and help you. Uh, there's a number of people that, that, that can come in and get, get you going. There's a vendor or two that can work with you on this. It's not expensive. It's not hard to do. It's, it's relatively easy just to get started. And you can begin anywhere. The OR, total joints, the imaging department, if you want to do physical therapy, you can do it there. You can do it anywhere in your, in, in your, in your hospital or in your, if, you're, if you're primary care or other ambulatory practice, it can be done. It can really be done anywhere. The data is good. You have to verify the data. Of course, anybody that's ever worked with data uh, knows that there are mistakes and errors in data. So you have to check it. The only real cultural thing that we found that's critical ultimately is transparency. That is a key major ingredient. If you don't have transparency, you're going to get pushback from your clinical group and the project will fail. There's tons of people, again, that will help you with the bits and bytes and nitty gritty and data integration and analytics. Uh, and the case studies really are very revealing. There's been a lot of stuff written on each one of the ones I went through. Um, that little acronym there, I, I thought this was common. John tells me it's not, but I've always known this is Google is your friend. So you can Google for cost savings at University of Utah or, or uh, you know, uh, w what happened at Yale New Haven quality program, and you can just Google for this stuff and find it. or you can contact me. I'm, I'm happy to share links. I'm delighted to have a conversation with you. You can email me. We can set up some time and chat. If you're in Florida, where I live, I'll jump in my car as long as you're below the I-4 corridor. Now, I'll go to Jacksonville or Tallahassee. I'm not so sure about, but I'll go to Jacksonville. I'll, I'll come out and talk to you. We can sit down and make a plan, look at your particular situation and see if there's any kind of better place to start or Maybe you got some oddball EHR, some strange or uh, ERP system. We'll try to figure out what tools are needed and how to actually get going on this. So I'm willing to help in any way, any way I can uh, to get this project going. It's really important. It's really, really important for you as providers, for, for your patients and for us, all of us as patients, that we move beyond volume and not just the quality. It's great that everybody's thinking now that we're going to go from a vo volume-based healthcare system to a quality-based healthcare system, but I think it's most unfortunate that if we stop there. In fact, I don't think it'll work if we stop there. We have to move to value, and value is what am I getting for my money, and that's really where we need to move. And true continuous costing, we believe, is an important ingredient 
in moving to value-based care, not just volume or quality-based care. So thank you for attending, and I'm happy to answer any questions now, or if you have any questions or inquiry, there's my email address. It's pretty easy, rob at showmarkresearch.com, and I'd be happy to, um, to follow up with on any questions or anything else you, you might have, any conversation. John, do you have any questions? Okay, so we just had one question come in. What types of software help organizations to track their costs? When you were talking about you have the data already, um, what would you recommend as far as software for tracking those costs to actually make sure they have the data? Well, you, you, you have the data. The, there's, there's, two, there's, three, there's three basic, there's two approaches and three potential technologies. If you want to do it yourself, which, which I think is just fine. I don't think this is rocket science. You can you need some technology to extract and load this and load the data into a database. You can use a free database like MySQL, or you can use if you're a Microsoft operation, you can use um, you could use uh, Microsoft SQL Server. You could actually store the data in an Excel in Excel, and, and you can treat an Excel data Excel spreadsheet as a database. So we're not going to look at the data using Excel, but we can load it in Excel as the database. So that's, that's kind of number one, is moving the data into a place where you can explore it. The second level of technology is how to examine the data, how to explore it. And that technology are products like Tableau. It's a great one, uh, very familiar with it. I've used it a bit, uh, very easy to use. Uh, anybody who, it's much easier than Excel to use. It's the easiest software I think I've ever used in my life. It's just very intuitive and it's all graphical. So once you get your connection to your uh, Excel, which is about two clicks or to your SQL database, which your IT guys can help you, it's about two clicks to do that. And then the ability to explore the data and set up dashboards and whatnot, is, it's, it's incredibly easy. It's easier than driving a car. It's the easiest thing I've ever done in my life. It's so phenomenal. It's very phenomenal. So there's Tableau, ClickView. There's a, another one out of Australia called Yellowfin, which is also extremely nice, very beautiful, very artistic. Um, Spotfire. I'm losing my mind right now. In the report, we actually list these. There's a few others. So those are the, if you're going to do it yourself, those are the two technologies you need. Get it out, store it, and then some way to explore it. The other approach is you can bring in a vendor. There are a number of vendors uh, who have turnkey solutions. Um, th some of them are a little expensive because they are really part and parcel of uh, budgeting and planning or activity-based costing systems. And then there's some that are pure plays that just do what we call true continuous costing that are quite inexpensive. There's one in particular that I've been looking at that uh, is less than an FTE to buy the software and get it implemented. So it's really inexpensive. So those are the, just the path you choose to go, either the vendor path or the do-it-yourself path would determine. Hopefully that answers the question. Okay, how are medical devices tracked? And are they all associated with a patient? Um, yeah. And are EHRs modified to track and associate a medical device to a patient? Well, the, 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 the medical device, let, let's, let's give a couple of examples. When you go in for a, 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 a cat, when you go to get a CAT scan, you're, the, the CAT scan machine, the, the operator puts in who you are, what your ID is, and it can be linked back through the billing system, who you are and who your patient ID is, so they can find you. Now, if you go to another facility, they won't be able to link you, but that doesn't matter because we're trying to get your costs at the facility. So within, within the facility, they know who you are, and that number of you goes into that machine. The time that you entered the machine goes in. If they use a contrast or any drug or something, that goes in. Who the operator is goes in how long you're there goes in. So now you're starting to see 
over time, you're developing a picture of which and what and what you're what you're getting. If it's a, a head with contrast, if it's just a lymph node scan, if it's a if it's a, 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 a scan of just your knee looking for an ACL tear, something I've had done. Uh, thank you, Skull Valley. Uh, if you if you uh, if you so that that information, all that information is in the machines, and it can it can be relatively easy pulled out of the machine. The EHRs also know who you are. So when you order when you order a uh, a a uh, a scan while you're in the hospital, that fact that you ordered it is in the EHR. So there's your linkage to know that it happened. So you would combine all of that data to get a complete picture on a patient. Okay, so the next question we have is, uh, are there any of these case studies that also address improvement in the provider experience that address the outcome and cost improvement challenge? Uh, I'm sorry, give that to me again, outcomes? Um, so looking at, um, are there any case studies that actually show improvement in the provider experience that have also helped to address um, the outcomes and cost challenge? So are there anything that actually improves the provider experience that you're seeing that um, kind of falls under this true continuous costing? Well, well I, I mean, I think I might look at the Yale New Haven study, uh, which is which is pretty good because the clinicians obviously, uh, they, they're the, they were the guys that, that did it. So I don't know if you mean provider as the, as the organization or the individual clinician, but the, every provider that, I've, that, that we found that has done this loves it because it saves them money without making them drop quality because you're improving productivity is what you're doing. So the quality doesn't go down and the cost savings go up. So you can, you get lots of benefits, visibility uh, as to potential train wrecks coming and you have extra money to spend on things you want to spend money on that you normally wouldn't have money to spend. So providers writ large love it. I don't know, you know, the only pushback we've heard from providers is when people try to do this without showing them the real data. They, they feel like they're being gamed. So providers really want to see the real data. And again, at, at, the, at Yale New, New Haven, from our research on this, it was pretty open as to what was going on. And it was driven by improving quality. And you can't drive quality in a declining revenue situation unless you improve productivity. You just can't do it. Uh, so you have to figure out how to get your, get your cost down with your quality up. And it really works out nicely. There's some charts and graphs if you, if you look for the study. It's, it's fairly impressive. And the, and the vendor that did this is Strata Decision. And I'm sure they'd be delighted to talk to you a lot about how they did it. Okay. I think this is also asking about clinical workflows adjusting so that they can make better use of their time and um, and things like that as far as reducing the cost of providing care. Well, a a oh, absolutely. I mean, when you when you start, this is what one of the other things that drove me into this was to, was why aren't people looking at how people use EHRs? I mean, I'm married to a doctor who spends probably four hours a day doing nothing but clicking around in the EHR. And I've always wondered why, and I, so one of the things I wrote, and I'm happy to share it, it was not really complete, is a model that developed an economic model when you hire scribes. I mean, how, and really what it turned out to be is how much can you, depending on your practice, how much, what, what, pra, what kind of practice you have, what, um, you know, how many patients you see, et cetera, et cetera, how much, you know, how much can you really afford to pay a scribe and still be, uh, contribute and not be a drain on your cost. I mean, how many, you know, you hire a scribe in theory, you're not doing as much computer work. You can, you can, uh, uh, you can see more patients, which is really what you want to do. Plus that's how you get money. So kind of what's the mix, what, what's the whole mix of variables that can tell, and it turns out that you can pay an awful lot for a scribe in most cases. Uh, and it, and it's better than break even to do it. So, yeah, I mean, all all of these things are kind of part and parcel to really looking at at your cost. And one of the one of the inputs, of course, was margin. I mean, what's your marginal profitability 
for seeing a patient. And if you've got high marginal profitability, you can pay a ton to see a scribe. If you've got low marginal profitability, you don't. So you start really thinking about all of your workflows to, to optimize productivity. Another, another imaging, there was a great presentation giving at the ANA uh, two years ago in Orlando on, on, on imaging departments where if you can, you can look at your imaging department productivity and figure out really economically what's the best time to schedule what and which of your operators are really best at doing what and what is the likelihood that certain types of, of scans, either CATs or CTs, contrast or without, would happen at a certain time? So you can use all that data inside your, your uh, machines to get a real picture of where you can optimize productivity so that your, your imaging department can, can flow much better. Uh, so you can play uh, football like Alabama and not like the Browns, if I can mix my metaphors. The next question we have is, uh, are the examples that we've provided are mostly hospital-based. Are there any good examples that are inclusive of ambulatory total continuous costing? You know, it's, it's a little tougher. Um, it's something we can talk about. They're, they've not been written up, and the ones I wanted to give were ones that you could access. Uh, there are some examples. Uh, certainly in, uh, in, uh, in surgery centers, in, uh, in cardiac, uh, it's work I'd like to do a little bit more of. So if you have an uh, ambulatory practice and you want to work on this, uh, let's get together and, and look at it. I've seen some. Um, I, don't, I, I think it's a little more challenging. Uh, that's a great that is that is the best that you know whoever asked that question i love you that is just a great question it's something uh you know that's it, it it's out there but it's it's not it's not crisp so the all the examples i gave are really crisp with with no debate no doubt lots of information behind it so let's let's get together and see if we can figure that one out i'm i'm uh i want to go after that i, I i'm I, I know how I would go about it. Uh, for one thing, I'd be very circumspect about getting into an ACO if I was in an ambulatory uh, group. <laughs> um, so let, let's, that, that's, boy, that, that's great. That puts me to work. I, John, I, I'm really into that one. That's a good one. That's yeah. a great question. Okay. Well, well, that person actually had a follow-up question, which is, how many hospital groups included non-employed doctor teams? So looking at that for true continuous costing as well. Well, yeah, no, absolutely. Having a, having, having a non-employed doctor team or an employee. Yeah, well, let me give exactly. you, let me, okay, okay. If you have a non-employed doctor team, your cost of the doctor is one number. It's how much you pay the doctor. So that's pretty easy. If it's an employed doctor team, it's all the costs the doctors incur while they're in your employee that if you want to really dive down, which you probably don't have to do in the beginning, if you really want to dive down, you got to get it. It's the same thing with if you outsource your physical therapy. It's one number if you outsource things. And that's why a lot of people in other industries outsource because the cost is just one number. If you own it, it's all the numbers of costs generated by that entity that you own. What we found, and it's what we liked about the Cleveland situation, was they did not have all employed doctors. A lot of the doctors were uh, uh, regular uh, doctors that were, were not employed. And again, the issue there was they could show them the costs, and if they, if they complied or they decided to be, to get, to get, to get it, you know, just locked into their head that, you know, we, we, it makes a difference which implant we use both from an outcome and from a cost perspective. And if we can get the same outcome with a cheaper implant, let's use it. And at least one physician decided, no, I'm using my implant no matter what. And basically they parted company. So uh, it's a little actually easier with non-employed physicians 
uh, in a way to, to track and get the cost, but it might be a little harder to make the cultural transition. Although I, I, I have to say this, being married to a doctor, having a daughter in medical school, knowing tons, all my friends are doctors. I got GI, radiation oncologist. I mean, you name the specialty, I got them as friends. Every doctor I know wants to do the best thing for their patient. And when they recognize that affordability is a giant problem, they don't really have trouble. If they can really get the data and they don't feel they're being manipulated to, to make changes, they just don't. I, I just don't, it's just not, a, it's just not a problem, but you gotta be transparent. It, okay. it, I, I was, I was not. I, I, I'll tell you, I was not surprised to see that. Just knowing the doctors, I do. And I heard this from everybody. Oh, they'll never change. And, you know, show them the truth. Let, let them know that this is for the patient's benefit. And look, doctors care about their patients. They just do. It's the way they are. Yeah. Sometimes they care more about their patients than their husbands. <laughs> <laughs> Um, all right, we have, we'll try to do more, but we have, we probably have a question. So I just want to quickly get to this, which is, what are the highest cost centers in a hospital, and do you recommend starting there? Why or why not? Um, I think, I think the thing is, the, the place to start is where you feel the most stress, and where you can get your handle around things, and maybe the most cooperative department. Uh, obviously, Right now, total joints, if you're in one of the areas that have bundle payments on total joints, I, I think that's a, a no-brainer to do. Um, if you've got a really high, an area you think is really high profit, like you're running a cardiac cath lab, I would definitely attack that. And that's pretty simple. There's one vendor out there right now that makes a solution that does, cardi does, does true continuous costing for cardiac cath labs, full stop. So... I would go, I would, I would start in, in those areas. Um, that's where I would go. Things where you, you know, you've got, you've got other things you've got to deal with. If, you, if you're going to do a quality program, if there's some place where there's somebody complaining about, you know, our quality is down, just got to hit them with the idea that we just can't improve quality. We got to improve value. So I don't think it's really the high cost areas as much as, it's kind of a situational thing. And, and again, I'm happy to, you know, we can tell me your situation and, and, uh, and I can tell you what I've, what I've heard and what I see other people uh, attacking, what other people are doing. All right. Um, I guess we have time for one more question, if we can keep it tight, which is how does the provider get info on pharmacy specialist and or facility claims they may have no visibility to? Is that relevant how, to continuous costing as we're framing it? How they get what? Um, info on pharmacy specialist and or facility claims. So, so other costs brokers for patient's care. Well, it, 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 if it's, we're not, we don't care about claims. Okay, that, this is about your cost of production, how much it costs you to do things. So I don't care about claims. You have a pharmacy system that issues drugs within your facility. Those costs are, those costs we can find because you've bought, you've purchased the, the drug. You've purchased the, 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 the pharmaceutical that you're now issuing to the patient and you're putting it on their bill if you're still in a in a, if you're in a non-bundled world if you're in a bundled world you're not even able to put it on the bill although you are certainly logging every drug you issue to a patient so we're, we're really interested in the provider costs we're not really paying attention to the cost to the payers i mean we're because that's a revenue issue so I, i'm not really worried at all about about that, I, I, we, we do need the actual, when we try to calculate margins, we, know, we need to know how much we actually got paid for that patient for that activity, but that's not really charges. That's the real bottom line net end of day, how much came in the door uh, for, that, for that encounter. And we've got that, we, that's, believe me, every hospital knows that, everybody knows how much is coming in. The, the, um, the CEO of Aetna 
is quoted someplace. John, your, John Sr. sent me the quote where he said, doctors work on cash, uh, hospitals work on revenue, and everybody else works on margin, and we're all going to have to get on the same page. So hospitals know their revenue. They know what they got paid. And, and we take the how much it costs, and we subtract out we subtract how much they got cost from how much we subtract how much it costs to provide the care from how much they got paid to get the margin and then if we want to go one step further we can figure out an overhead number to throw in there but we know how to do overhead because we all do the 2552 reports so we know how to sling uh and we, we do budgeting and planning and we do we have those kind of systems laying around that we can always throw we can always throw the overhead number of things but, you, but overhead is a tough thing to manage. I mean, you, your visibility and your ability to, to change an overhead number takes years to do that, where the ability to sit down and say, um, you know, we're, we're, we got our best, most productive imaging guy working the midnight shift, and there's really nothing happening. So why don't we try to get more imaging done at night when he's here or why don't we get that guy so we can get him to work during the day when we're swamped? Now, there's, that's, that's really what we're talking about. But run out and say we're going to spend, you know, uh, uh, you know we're going to, you know, replace the imaging equipment or, or purchase an imaging department uh, to change the overhead number or sell the imaging department to a private entity. Th those things take a really long time. You can't change those very fast. But the true continuous costing, because we're looking at the real cost in real time, you can make a lot of changes really fast. And because we do variance analysis, we can stay on top of those all the time. John, I, again, any additional questions, they can forward to me, and I'm happy to – this is what I do. This is my, my life. Uh, this one CFO of one HCA facility uh, thought I'm crazy, but um, I'm really into this. <laughs> um, it's my life uh, to look at this, to, to do everything we can to make healthcare affordable and to not lose the quality that we get. I think we get great healthcare in the United States. I just think it's been become for a lot of people, for all too many people, out of the reach. It's just too expensive. And the only way this is going to get fixed, based upon the numbers, is for providers to break out a sharp pencil, or in this case, a somewhat powerful computer, and some modern technology, and focus on how much we're, how much we're paying, and really tune this baby back and get, these system, get this healthcare system more productive. We can do it. It's done. It's, done. it's not like... It's not like the first man to land on the moon or anything. It's it's just a matter of uh, of paying attention. The ROI is there. The rewards are there. It's good for everybody to uh, to do this. All right, Rob. Well, thank you very much for the, taking the time today to share this with everyone, and thank you to all of our attendees for coming on.